Okay, we're in Hebrews 9 and had gotten down into verse 9 in our discussion. And verses 9 and verse 10 is dealing with the fact that uh, the Old Covenant could not cleanse the conscience. Uh, we noted that the word figure there is the Greek word parabole, parable in our English. That it, it was a parable for the time then present, which was all, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaineth to the conscience. And we had gotten down to that word conscience. Conscience is, uh, literally means what? No. The literal meaning. You have con, which is the prefix, which means with. And science means knowledge. With knowledge is the literal meaning. Uh, it is a knowledge of, uh, within oneself. Uh, educated thought is a good way of thinking about it. Uh, <clears throat> we don't have time to look into these. Uh, we'll mention probably a couple of them, but you might study uh, Hebrews 9 and verse 14 along this line, which we'll get to or should get to this morning. Uh, Hebrews 10 and verse 3 and verse 22. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 9, and we'll mention in a minute 1 Peter 3, 21. Uh, if we had time, we'd go into each one of those passages and look at them, but uh, under the first covenant, they never had a pure conscience before God. Now why? They were still in their sins. They, they knew that they still had their sins facing them, that we use the term, the sins on the Day of Atonement were rolled forward, whether you want to use that phraseology, but they were, at the end of every year, the sins would come back upon them. So they always had their sins facing them. They never had a pure conscience. Now then, at the first of this, he says this is a parable. Well, the parable, really, you see the aspect of it in chapter 10 and verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The priest, before going into the temple, the temple proper. Uh, what did they have to do? Wash themselves, Wash themselves at the brazen labor. Uh, and that would be washing all of the physical impurities off of themselves uh, so that they could come in. Well, and we don't have time really to draw the parable out, but uh, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. What is it not? Which was what the priest would do prior to entering the temple. It's not that. Why? Because instead it's the answer of a good conscience. What did they not have? They didn't have a perfect conscience. What do we have? In the act of baptism, we have a pure conscience. Why, what's the difference? They didn't have the, truly the taking away of sins. Um, they didn't realize that, though, did they? I mean, every, year that the, every year the priests going in, had, they had to realize that, that all of their sins were coming upon them again. Um, and thus the sacrifices for the sins. Um, 
And I think the knowledge also that the blood of bulls and goats could not really take away their sin. I think all of that uh, entered into it. Uh, they would have to have that understanding. Um, <clears throat> so in, as we wash ourselves in the act of baptism, we wash ourselves not from the physical impurities of the flesh, but of the spiritual impurities so that we can enter into the church, wash away our sins. And since Christ has torn that veil in two, remember uh, when he died upon the cross, the veil was rent from top to bottom. We have boldness in, to enter into the very presence of God. We have boldness to enter the Holy of Holies. We, and I, we could talk about this aspect a great deal, but we need to have a knowledge or a conscience that our sins are truly forgiven. How many times do we have difficulty forgiving ourselves of things? I did this, it's so bad, and... Have you asked God to forgive? Yes, yes, many times. Why? Don't you believe that he forgave you the first time? <laughs> if you did, then it's gone. It's washed away. Sins are no longer remembered. Um, but our problem is we have the continued guilt and we can't let go of them even though God has. Uh, but I say that's a whole other lesson <clears throat> that we don't have time for. Verse 10 then, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. The word in, which stood only in, is a Greek word, it's actually the Greek word epi, it means upon, not literally in, uh, but upon. It is the idea, well, let me just, uh, we've talked about prepositions and how prepositions are always, or many times used to circle. Remember we talked about uh, the Greek word ek, out from within. Remember we talked about apo being from the edge of. Well, this is upon. Epi uh, would be it. It's upon the circle. The eye is what it is. In other words, the basis of the Levitical system is these things. Uh, which stood on the basis of meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances. So that first covenant and the first tabernacle, the sacrifices, were based upon the meats and drinks and various washings. Get a lot more meaning out of that word than the, our word <coughs> and, don't we? <laughs> Although we, would we could come to the same understanding without knowing the Greek word, the Greek word helps us uh, in our understanding. <laughs> word meets is a Greek word which literally would be our word food. Uh, the English word meats, when the King James was translated, was a more of a general term for what we would use for food, uh, representing all foods. We have limited the idea of meats to generally animal food, uh, but it would not be in that regard either the Greek word nor back in the when King James was translated when they translated meat. Washings and let's discuss this word a little bit.
That's the Greek word. Baptizmos. I get missed an S. Baptizmos. There. Um, now, what word do you see in that? Baptism. This word, baptismos, is found three times in the New Testament. Here, Hebrews 6 and verse 2, and Mark 7 and verse 4. Every time it is referring to the Jewish ordinances of washings. A lot of times, if you turn back, especially to chapter 6 and verse 2 of Hebrews, which we discussed whenever it was, <laughs> uh, a lot of people have difficulty when they're dealing with that because they immediately think of New Testament baptism because it's translated baptisms there instead of the word washings. Uh, We don't have time, but let me give you some passages to study in regards to these washings. Uh, Numbers 19, verses 7 through 10, and, he, and verse 19. Leviticus 14, verses 8 and verse 9. Leviticus 16 and verse 4, verse 24, and verse 26. Leviticus 17 and verse 15. Leviticus 22 and verse 6. And Exodus 29 and verse 4. <clears throat> now again, these are the ceremonial washings of Judaism that he's dealing with. So, 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 so the Hebrew word would be a, a parallel to baptism, but it's only be Hebrew in, in these verses. And they have a similar word to baptism, but it's only Okay, pretty much so, yes. Um, then he says, carnal ordinances. The word carnal is from the Greek word sarx. And its literal meaning is flesh. These are ordinances, and what's an ordinance? Right, ritual, um, mm, statute. statute, more the idea, law is the word I was trying to get to. It's a law, an ordinance, uh, a command, any of those ideas. Thus, fleshly ordinances, fleshly commands, fleshly laws. Um, he's dealing with the laws that had to do with the con fleshly conditions, uh, the food, drink, cleanliness, those types of ordinances, those types of laws. Those carnal, fleshly, worldly ordinances were to end with the beginning of the New Testament. And we don't have time, but uh, study uh, just Ephesians 2 and verse 15, where it talks about having abolished in the flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments. What is that? That's law of ordinances, fleshly ordinances. The law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make himself a twain, one new man. Also, Colossians 2 and verse 16 and verse 20. And y'all can study those on your own again. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Notice that these were imposed. The word imposed. It's a Greek word which literally means to lay upon or to rest upon. In fact, the same... Oh, I erased it. <laughs> that same uh, Greek word epi is the prefix of uh, to lay here, to lay, and thus to lay upon. They are imposed. What is it? They've been laid upon those individuals. They rest upon them. Notice that these carnal ordinances were imposed until... What is the word until indicating? Adverb of time. It's an adverb of time. Thus, there's going to be a time element in relating, relationship to these <coughs> carnal ordinances. It shows that they would end. When would they end? Hmm? Time of Reformation. Okay, at the time of Reformation, within the statement here. When you have the time of Reformation, these carnal or fleshly ordinances would come to an end. Word Reformation. It is a word which means correction, amendment, or reformation. When you reform something, you correct it. You amend it. Here, the application is to the introduction of the New Testament and specifically in relationship to the forgiveness of sins. The New Testament, or excuse me, the Old Testament was never a satisfactory way to forgive sins. These washings, these, uh, uh, going back to verse 9, gifts and sacrifices, the meat, drink, divers, washings, carnal ordinances, none of these things could ever forgive sin. That could only come, what is that? That's the correction. That's the amendment. The amendment of life, which was with Christ. Um, and again, uh, I wish we had time to really study, for example, Matthew the 19th chapter and verse uh, 28, where Jesus says, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, well, regeneration, of being born again, a rebirth, or re reformation of life. In the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in his throne of glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, when is that taking place? Right now. Right now. We are now in that time of reformation, or that time of regeneration. Uh, then you can tie in Titus 3 and verse 5 with that. Um, not of works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration. You couldn't tie in 2 Corinthians 5.20, even though it's, not, it's the same idea, it's just not the same word. Well, it's the same idea, that's true, but um, it's different wording is used there. And we're catching upon this idea of regeneration, re reformation. Um, but uh, here's the washing of regeneration and renewing. There's the same idea, a renewing of the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. And you can tie in also Acts the third chapter in verse 21. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his prophet, holy prophets since the world began. What was the one you gave before that, that, that one just now? Titus 3, 5. Thank you. 
So with the coming in of the New Testament, that time of Reformation, those carnal ordinances or fleshly ordinances would be done away with. Now then, verses 11 through 15 shows the superiority of Christ's ministry in the heavenly tabernacle. Verse 11 shows that Christ is high priest of a perfect sanctuary. Um, but Christ, notice the contrast with the word but, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say not of this building. The words being come, literally means to become near or to or beside to place oneself by the side of something that's the literal meaning of the word being come here in the greek i say definition for parable no sort of uh it's not. Uh, okay, excuse me. Parable. To show you the difference, uh, parable is parabole in the Greek. This is paragenomai. Oh, okay. The, the, prefix, though. Okay. the root word is genomai, which is to be or to become, and then para is to uh, beside. So, beside to become. <laughs> but that phrase doesn't make a lot of sense, thus to become near or to the side of something, to place oneself by the side of something. Um, here it is dealing with Christ and his advent into this world, that here's the Messiah is from outside of humanity. What is he? He's God. That goes back to our study of chapter 1 and chapter 2, that he's God. He's outside of humanity, and what does he do? He becomes human through the course of the virgin birth. And so we have humanity joined with divinity. He is what? He is becoming near humanity. Laid along, or placed, placing himself beside of humanity. Um, so Christ being come, specifically here a high priest of good things to come. Now then, there is a variant reading here. If um, does anybody have the American Standard or uh, anything, Carl, you have American Standard? In uh, what does it say instead of, of good things to come? And that's the American standard? What? Okay, does it have realized? Okay, have come. And some use realized, uh, good things realized. King James puts it to come. Uh, variant reading in the Greek as to whether you take the, uh, what the King James bases it on, which is the uh, Textus Receptus or the majority text, or like modern day translators take uh, the Westcott and Hort text, Depending on which one you take depends on which, how you're going to translate. Whether, like the King James, good things to come, or good things having come, or having been realized, something along that line. It has reference to the good things. Whether, and it really doesn't make any difference because both aspects are, are true and accurate, biblical. So... You know, it's one of those scholarly debates that if you wanted to get into as to which one was right, go right ahead. 
I, I don't care which one you want to take, really, because both aspects are, are biblical and true. Um, it has reference to the approach to God. Okay, it would be taking the same as the majority text, uh, sounds like. Um, it is a better, it's dealing with the better covenant. And specifically within context here, the, the forgiveness of sins, the total forgiveness of sins. Now, whether you're looking at it from the standpoint of that Old Testament time in which these are the good things to come, or whether you're looking at it from the standpoint of Paul's audience at that time, it has come. It has been realized. That's why I say it doesn't really matter just the perspective that you're dealing with it from. The same, it's still the same teaching and referring to the same aspect. Um, but uh, it is those that forgiveness of sins that's found in Christ. Uh, the word by though. Um, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. It is the Greek word, uh, it's, uh, oh, I erase that circle again. Uh, it's dia, uh, through, is the idea. It's through these things. Um, and it is a preposition, really, of instrumentality. It is through the tabernacle that a greater and more perfect. And is that good English, more perfect? Do we have any English majors in here? We need to call Gary Summers on that one. <laughs> That's, if you put that on an English paper, uh, the teacher would, oh, they would go bananas on that. No way. Poor English. Both words are in the Greek. Um, it's not poor Greek, it is poor English. But there's a lot of things that are poor English that's not poor Greek. <laughs> uh, it is a more perfect. In English, we would just say it's perfect. But here, literally, as I said, both words are in the Greek. And again, the word perfect is what? What does it mean? Complete. Complete, full, full grown. Um, that... <laughs> okay, that's a, that is a good question. That's what we were about to discuss. <laughs> So thank you for the introduction. Uh, how can it be more perfect? Was the Old Testament system, the washings and all of that, was it perfect? No? No, the preparing figure in the New Testament uh, realities. And it was incomplete. It was, it was, it was, it was like a hand in the glove. <laughs> now, both now what, the, uh, what did you say? Uh, that's close. That's very close. It was perfect for what it was intended for. Its purpose. And so it was perfect from that standpoint. Um, was it perfect from the standpoint that it could actually take away sin? No. Before what it was intended for, it was perfect. Um, that's why this is more perfect. There is that emphasis that yes, the old covenant was perfect in a sense as to what it's intended for. Yet here you have something greater. It was given a, given a reveal to in Galatians 3.19 not to solve sin fully. No, it wasn't. It could not and was never intended to do that, though. And that's the whole point. The Old Covenant was never intended to take away sin. Uh, and see, that's what we get into our thinking. 
Well, it wasn't complete. It wasn't perfect because it couldn't do this. When, when there, it was never intended to do it. You're right, it could not do it, but it was, was not intended for that purpose. That's the reason you wonder about premillennialism, they got a loose screw, you know. <laughs> and go back to all that junk. You know? Well, some forms of premillennialism say that that old system is going to come back into being. Uh, why? I go back into that inferior system, but uh, that's another study. The new, the old it was not perfect from the standpoint it could not save sins, but it wasn't intended to that. The new is more perfect in that it could save man completely and totally. And so it is more perfect. <laughs> so that's how it can be more perfect. I was getting to the English. Something's Complete cannot be more complete. Something perfect, it cannot be more perfect. More. In our thinking, that's right. I mean, English, and I'm not talking about and the Greek that this translates from. It's, English would not allow that. It's, it is, or it would allow it from the standpoint of context, the aspect that you're dealing with. Here's the Old Testament law. It was complete in everything that God wanted it to do, it was perfect. But it could not take away sins, but it wasn't intended for that. Thus, here you have something that is able to do that, and so it is perfect as well, but it adds to something that the old could not do. Yes. You, you can say that, Dale, she I'm, had I'm first. Sorry. I'm sorry. I just wanted to maybe give it in this analogy. If we look at it from the perspective of it is perfect or complete or whole. It was whole in the Old Testament as if it were the cake. The cake was whole, it was made with flour and sugar, etc. It had all of the ingredients in it. It was given whole by God. To say that the, the Ten Commandments or any part of it was not whole would be to discredit what God gave to Moses. But yeah. it was whole in that when the whole cake was given in the New Testament, it was given through Christ with the icing on the cake. you like my analogy, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I actually think it's a pretty good analogy. I, not being a cook, and I, I, told, I tell people I help my wife a great deal in the kitchen. Yeah, right. I stay it's out. More, it's more perfect. It's more complete. It's more with complete. The icing on the with cake. the icing on the cake. That's a good analogy, I think. That's true. Um, <laughs> with the ice cream on top. And, but then you forget about that, the cake and just give me the ice cream. Um, <laughs> okay, Dale. The, the types of the Old Testament were perfect, though. And, and, and you can see all that. Well, it, uh, and tied in, they're tied in, tied in the Romans 7 12. Well, sure, all of those types were perfect. And even the types represented the the animal sacrifices represented the sacrifice of Christ. But the animal sacrifice couldn't take away the sin, even though it was a type of Christ. So, it was, uh, this is something that is a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Not made with hands. This is a tabernacle that was not made with hands. Who was it made by? Okay, it was made by God. Um, and we won't take the time, but uh, study Luke 17 and verse 20. Uh, and there he's talking about uh, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Uh, also study Romans the seven, uh, 14th chapter and verse 17. Uh, and there he's dealing with the aspect that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Um, the word building here, that is to say not of this building, is literally a word which means creation. In other words, this building that he's dealing with this tabernacle that is more perfect, more 
a greater and more perfect tabernacle, does not belong to this natural creation. It's not of this material aspect, either uh, in material or in the maker of it. So not of this building, not of this world, as opposed to the fleshly ordinances of the old covenant. Now then, verses 12 through 15, the sacrificial blood is better. And verse 12, it was by his own blood, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. I was afraid I was going to say neither with the blood of bulls and goats. Carl? I was just going to say the Old Testament. Exactly what God intended for it to do, to bring Christ to us. Yeah. And without the Old Testament, how would we have it, Christ? And that's uh, Galatians 3 26 or 20, 23, I think. Right. Christ um, just showed yeah. up on that, the planet and said, I'm the That it was God. our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And that would take us to Galatians 4 and verse 4 that in the fullness of time that God was preparing everything for the right time in the sending of his son. Um, I, only by blood could the high priest enter into the Holy of Holies. And that go, takes us back to verse 7 really which we studied. So uh, neither by the blood of goats and calves. So blood had to be used. Uh, the blood offered by the Messiah, though, was different. It was not by the blood of goats and calves, but it was his own blood. Um, and study of Hebrews 10 and verse 4 would go along with this in reality. But the Messiah is both the victim and the high priest. Now, high priest was never the victim in the Old Covenant. He, the victim there was the goats and calves. Christ was the victim as well as the high priest. He served in both aspects. Um, the word by, neither by the blood of bulls and goats, or there I said it, <laughs> the, the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. There, again, it's this Greek word, dia, through. It is through the blood of bulls, goats and calves, through his own blood. We say blood of bulls and goats so often, it's hard to change it. Yeah, next time it does, thankfully. <laughs> what the? We, we use the phrase through modifying that. Does that mean because of the same difference? Through or because it's of? the instrumentality of it. Here's the. This is the instrument that is used. Um, by his own blood. Two words that could be translated in relationship to his own blood. Uh, the first, autos. The other, theos. Autos, uh, that he could have used here, would refer to the fact that he entered by means of his own blood. Now the thing is, he doesn't use that word here. He uses idios by his own blood, idios. Idios is dealing with a personal, private, unique ownership. That's your difference. A unique private ownership. <clears throat> and thus, this was his own 
his unique or his personal blood that he used. Uh, and so it was not just human blood. It was blood of a unique kind of blood. A blood that was sinless and that was deity. Uh, the, the, is that saying he took the... He took the facts about his blood, or he actually took no. physical blood up there? It, it would be spiritual from the standpoint yeah, he right. took his spiritual blood into the most holy place, which represented heaven. He took them into heaven itself to make an atonement for sin. He died here upon this earth, but he had to take his blood to heaven as an atonement for sins. And that's what we'll see later on in this chapter in reality. Um, and he did this, he entered once. And this is a Greek word which means once for all. In distinction to the Aaronic priest that entered every year. He entered into the holies. Now I think this is interesting. He entered in, it's translated the holy place in our King James. Literally it is, he entered into the holies. Paul starts using the in this tabernacle basically that there's only one compartment now. It is the holies. Whether you're talking about the holy place or the most holy place, doesn't make any difference. It's the holies. And he uses them interchangeably now. Um, and that goes back to that veil of the temple being rent. To obtain... Word obtained is a specialized word meaning to find, to come upon, or to find a thing that's sought for, to discover. And again, there's two Greek words. Uh, he could have used a word which mean uh, general words for, for obtaining, to just obtain something. But he used a specialized word meaning to find or to come upon. There's an aspect of that it was sought. It's also in the middle voice, meaning to find for oneself. And thus, he was seeking for something to find and finding it and appropriating it as his own. The Messiah found and procured salvation by means of his own personal, private blood outpoured blood. And we'll have to wait for the word redemption till next week and we'll continue from there.